Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Tricia Scaglione, and I am the director of the Tinnitus and Sound Sensitivities Clinic and an assistant professor at the University of Miami Ear Institute. I thank the Committee for the Corona Initiative for inviting me to present today. Today, I'm going to speak with everybody about the collaborative care of the complex tinnitus patient. In regards to disclosures, I am a board member of the Tinnitus Practitioners Association, or TPA, and I'm on the Scientific Advisory Committee for the American Tinnitus Association, or ATA. For the purpose of today's presentation, I'm going to be focusing on a complex tinnitus case and how it was managed. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into extensive information on the ins and outs of tinnitus. However, Dr. Katherine Drescher gave an excellent presentation this past Friday, which hopefully many of you had the chance to attend. In her talk, she touched upon many of the important topics pertaining to the who, the what, the when, the where's and the why's of tinnitus. So if you um, didn't have the opportunity to see it yet, I would highly recommend that you take some time to check it out. What I do want to share with you is that tinnitus is extremely common. In fact, it affects approximately 50 million people in the United States. And that's a lot of patients you could be having coming through your clinic doors. Most patients are, I'm sorry, most individuals are surprised to learn that tinnitus is our number one service related disability. And why you as an ENT should care about your tinnitus patients is because tinnitus affects the overall quality of life for the sufferer, whether that be sleep, relaxation, concentration, mood, personal relationships, work life, social life, just everything. And unlike a physical injury like a broken bone where a cast is used and someone can see there's an injury, tinnitus is invisible. So it makes it really difficult for those around the, the sufferer to understand what they're going through and to empathize with them. And it's not uncommon for tinnitus patients to feel like they're alone, that nobody really understands what they're going through. Your consultation with your patients is extremely critical. Quite often, just a simple two, three minute talk about what tinnitus is, what tinnitus is not, realistic expectations for management can really help to demystify the, the bothersome symptoms for them and can be a turning point for that individual. And whatever you do, please don't tell it people that come into your clinic that they can't, that they just have to live with it. Patients don't just have to live with it. Fortunately, there are a number of management options out there that can help to reduce tinnitus awareness and disturbance levels. And um, we know we wanna make sure that we're sharing this information with our patients. While hearing loss tops the list for one of the most commonly accepted causes for tinnitus, there are a number of other diseases conditions, and precipitating factors that we as healthcare providers need to be aware of. It's really important that when you're managing your tinnitus patient, you realize that the tinnitus is just a symptom of an underlying condition. Something else is occurring in the body, something that we must investigate and manage when possible. When I see my patients, I tell them, it's never just managing their tinnitus. We have to always manage the whole patient. And to simplify this, I use an analogy of a tinnitus patient is like an onion. The tinnitus is always the center of the onion, and then there's layers. Some patients only have a few layers, and others have many, many layers. I explain that while it's important that we examine these layers, um, you know, it may seem like we're really delving into their, their health history and really wanting to know a lot about them. It's because we need to know about these layers. We need to examine them and how they can be contributing to or exacerbating their tinnitus so we can effectively manage the tinnitus. And so some examples you might see on the screen here when we're managing the whole patient. We want to know, are there, are there jaw problems? Do they have TMJ or TMD? Is there cervical involvement? Perhaps they have some somatosensory components to their tinnitus. What drugs or medications are they on? Perhaps they were taking something that was potentially ototoxic. Are they engaged in activities like alcohol or smoking that could be contributing to other health conditions? Uh, cardiovascular 
disease, viral disease, hyper or hypothyroidism. These can all be contributing factors that we need to know about if we're going to manage our patient effectively. In the majority of tinnitus cases that you hear about at maybe conferences or read about in journals, I, I personally find that the patients go to the ENT with complaints of ringing in their ears. Maybe it's driving them crazy and they wanna do something about it. They want that magic pill, they want that quick fix. In most situations, the ENT conducts an examination, they order a hearing test and sometimes imaging, and usually rules that there's no major contributing cause to their tinnitus. Patients are diagnosed with tinnitus, quite often hearing loss, and then they're referred to an audiologist for tinnitus management. The audiologist may or may not perform a tinnitus assessment. And in the case of hearing loss, they can maybe uh, fit the patient with some hearing aids, or if the patient has normal hearing, then they might be fit with some form of sound generator, such as an ear level device, or uh, perhaps they're recommended to use a tabletop device. Tinnitus education or counseling is performed, and the majority of patients report some noticeable improvement to some degree um, in their tinnitus over the next six to 12 months. But realistically, these are really straightforward, easy cases. As an audiologist, I feel like those are my dream tinnitus cases. They come in, you know exactly what to do with them, and you have some, you know, some nice results. Patient's happy, everyone's happy. But realistically, what about the challenging cases? You know, I feel like there's just not enough healthcare providers that talk about those challenging cases. Who's involved in the management process? How are the patients managed? What are the considerations? Which is why I selected a particular case study to talk about with everyone today. So the case I'm gonna to present to you is not your typical bilateral tinnitus secondary to presbycusis case. Um, it's, it's far more complex. This is a patient that we've seen over five, almost six years in our clinic. And so for the sake of time, um, I do have to just give, give brief overviews of their, um, their, their condition and their examinations and the findings. So please bear with me. So patient LS is a 48-year-old male. He presented to our clinic in June of 2015 with complaints of dizziness and vertigo. He also reported that he was ex experiencing extreme headaches and he had sleep issues. Um, and he particularly mentioned that if he was to roll over on his right side, it would trigger an extreme headache and cause uh, additional sleep disruption. At the time of appointment, tinnitus was casually mentioned, but it was not the main concern. Therefore, not much focus was placed on it. As any healthcare provider, our, our team wanted to know, you know, what's the backstory? What preceded the patient's symptoms? So as I mentioned, patient came to us in June of 2015 with that headache, dizziness, um, the headache and the dizziness and vertigo being his main issues. So he said, you know, tell us about what's been going on. He said in January of 2015, so six months prior, he was experiencing the sensation of an unstable heart rate and migraines. His local wife, his wife, not his local wife, but his wife convinced him to go to the local emergency room. And according to the patient, he was demonstrating signs of a TIA, but imaging came back negative. He claimed that while his vital signs were unstable, he was not sent for any form of cardio workup. Ultimately, he was discharged from the ER and he was instructed to follow up with his neurologist about migraines. Fast forward six months to June of 2015, the patient is still having symptoms. And these symptoms included um, these, these terrible, terrible headaches to the point that he felt like his head was exploding. And so back to the ER he went. According to the patient, he again was demonstrating unstable vital signs. Um, so at this point, the, the ER team had the patient undergo another round of imaging, and he also had a cardio workup. As it turns out, this patient's MRI results demonstrated that he had suffered a right posterior parietal stroke. And oftentimes, patients who suffer a parietal stroke are unaware that they even had a stroke in the first place. Now, had he experienced a temporal lobe stroke, you know, this could have been correlated with changes in his hearing, a cerebellar stroke could, be, could impact his balance and cause some dizziness, and even a brainstem stroke, something affecting the midbrain, the pons or medulla, can also result in hearing changes or dizziness. 
but he had a parietal stroke. And, you know, maybe he can have some changes in hearing because of parietal issues, but parietal typically affects sensation and spatial awareness. So not necessarily consistent with his symptoms. Also, when you have a right-sided stroke, we would traditionally expect him to be exhibiting symptoms on the left side of his body. However, he was not presenting with this nor um, relayed that he was experiencing that at, um, at any point January through June. And as I mentioned, his imaging was conducted in January when he first went to the ER and it was normal. So we do know that this stroke took place sometime within those six months. All right, so he has this parietal lobe stroke. We know it's going on. Well, because of those unstable vitals, he also went or went some a cardio workup, including a 24 hour Holter monitor and results came back positive for cardiomyopathy. So here this poor guy has experienced a TIA and heart failure. And what's unfortunate is that he didn't have his cardio workup in January. So it's dip difficult to know just how long these symptoms have been present for. We don't know if the cardiomyopathy and the stroke occurred at the same time or separate events. It's one of those, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg. Perhaps the stroke led to his heart issues. It's, it's unclear. But um, according to the patient, he did say that his physician told him that the signs of the heart failure were not recent, that it was uh, previous heart failure. And as ENTs and audiologists, we know that any disruption to blood flow to the inner ear can result in changes in hearing, balance, or even tinnitus. And um, disruption, to the, disruption of blood flow to the brain can certainly be uh, critical as well. The patient was then referred to neurology, cardiology, and ENT. So stepping back to our uh, June 2015 appointment, June 2015 appointment when he was seeing our ENT, our ENT suspected differential diagnosis of vestibular migraines and referred the patient for vestibular testing. So he comes back to our clinic for a comprehensive vestibular workup. <clears throat> At the time, he stated that his vertigo was triggered by getting out of bed or showering. His symptoms of true spinning were lasting minutes in duration, were accompanied by fatigue and, pre and presyncope. If the patient was doing too much around the house, like laundry and so on, he would feel a rush in his neck and head with significant headache. And per the patient, he was advised to rest when this was happening. As the purpose of this presentation is to focus on tinnitus, which I'll eventually get to, I promise. I'm going to limit the vestibular discussion to say that the patient was seen for cervical and ocular vemps, rotary chair, subjective visual vertical testing, which is part of rotary chair, and VNG, video nystagmography testing. This patient has a pre-existing history of left middle ear involvement, but was unspecified. We do know that the left temp was extremely shallow to the point that it was flat. So in terms of his VEMP results, his VEMP results were ultimately deemed inconclusive. Um, this is most likely because of that poor uh, middle ear function that it can compromise the integrity of test findings and present as a uh, false asymmetry or false weakness. His rotary chair symptoms demonstrated some peripheral findings, but no asymmetry was present. So it is possible that by this point, the peripheral involvement was compen excuse me, compensated. His SVV testing demonstrated uh, utricular involvement, a utricular dysfunction, which was most likely the left ear and did show it was uncompensated. And in regards to his VNG, it was within normal limits. However, the bithermal calorics were deferred, again, because of that compromised middle ear system. The ENT referred the patient to physical therapy for uh, vestibular rehabilitation therapy, or VRT, with a focus on utricular dysfunction. While the patient was at VRT, he also noted that the therapist was working on managing his strabismus. The patient was also recommended to continue to follow up with his neurologist, cardiologist, and PCP. So he started with us in 2015, and he would come back for annual checkups. In 2016, he reported that his dizziness had 90% improved. So that's, that's really great news. 
In April of 2017, he came back in and stated that in, in regards to neurology, the neurologist was now using Botox for his headaches. And a month later, in May of 2017, his dizziness significantly increased. So, you know, was there possibly a correlation between the two? So the patient was back in VRT and undergoing aggressive uh, management on that front, hoping to uh, have improvement in symptoms again. And unfortunately, because of the dizziness, he was unable to drive long distances, which was uh, significantly impacting his, his quality of life. He continued to be followed by his cardiologist for the mon monitoring of his heart condition and his PCP because of high blood pressure, cholesterol issues, and high cholesterol and gout. So at this point, let's do a check-in of how many providers the patient's seen uh, you know, in this, at this point. He's seen two ER teams. He's seen an ENT, a physical therapist, uh, including the vestibular rehabilitation therapist, his neurologist, his cardiologist, his PCP, as well as audiology. In regards to audiology, the patient was seen for routine audiograms over the years. For the purpose of discussion, today I wanted to present to you an audiogram from 2016 and an audiogram from 2019. As you can see on the screen, the hearing is essentially normal in both ears, and there's really no change between the three years. Tympanometry demonstrated a shallow tymp in the left ear, which can, was consistent with previous middle ear involvement, and this was present on both the 2016 and 2019 audiograms. The patient also underwent high frequency audiometric testing in 2016 and 2019. A comparison of the results demonstrate a significant threshold shift specifically in the right ear, which I've highlighted here on the screen for you. We also conduct otoacoustic emissions, high frequency otoacoustic emissions from 1000 to 10,000 Hertz to assess outer hair cell function and our patients reporting tinnitus. Since the audiogram was essentially normal through 10,000 Hertz in both ears, we would really expect normal to near normal outer hair cell function bilaterally, and we would expect those results to be symmetrical between ears because the audiogram was symmetrical. But taking a look on these results, you see that that's not actually the case, that something's going on in that left ear, especially in the, uh, the frequency ranges of about 4,000 to 10,000 Hertz. So let's take a closer look at this left ear. You can see that the audiogram and the OAEs are not consistent with each other. In that four, five, six, eight range, hearing is, is normal, borderline to normal hearing, but those outer hair cell results are showing that they are reduced to absent. So there is definitely an inconsistency there. And for discussion's sake, you know, is this because of the middle ear involvement? Again, the left ear was the, the ear that was involved. Um, however, if it was because of the middle ear involvement, we would suspect there to be an impact of the low frequency responses, not necessarily the high frequency responses. So it's suspected that this is more of a subclinical indicator um, demonstrating that there's some dysfunction of the hair cells occurring in those higher frequencies that should be monitored. Now fast forward to July of 2019. So now we've jumped from 2015 um, to 2019. At this point, the patient has been managed for his headaches, his dizziness, his vertigo, um, you know, many of his other major con uh, conditions and in symptoms. And at this point, now his tinnitus has, has moved up the totem pole and has become the culprit. Um, and because the tinnitus is now bothersome to him, he, he met with his ENT and he asked if it was possible to seek management for the tinnitus. Therefore, he was referred to our tinnitus clinic. At the University of Miami, any patient that's interested in tinnitus management must complete a tinnitus education appointment. At these appointments, we talk about realistic expectations of uh, tinnitus and um, the causes you know, a, a, a really nice overview about what tinnitus is and what can be done for it. So we are setting our patient up for their tinnitus management journey. These appointments are offered as individual appointments or in group formats known as a shared medical appointment or an SMA. 
This patient opted to an attend an SMA with his wife. And then following this group session, he opted to come in for an individual tinnitus assessment, which is a psychometric evaluation of his tinnitus with an audiologist. I was the individual who was providing the care to him. And at that time, he explained to me that he was only experiencing tinnitus in his right ear, and he believed it started sometime between the span of January and June of 2015. So this correlates back to when he was having all of his, his other major symptoms. And at the time of appointment, he was indicating that his tinnitus was impacting all aspects of his life, that he was just you know, really experiencing debilitating tinnitus and he was desperate for help. So I wanna highlight that this patient is reporting that his tinnitus is in his right ear, but looking back at his audiogram, the hearing is, is normal um, in the 250 to 8,000 Hertz range, but in those high frequencies, in that 2019 audiogram, it did show he had high frequency hearing loss there. But his left ear is the one that had the compromised middle ear system and the decreased high frequency autoacoustic emissions. So pretty interesting. So we went ahead with the psychometric evaluation or the tinnitus assessment. And the purpose of conducting a tinnitus assessment is really to aid the patient in counseling and in some cases can help to identify device candidacy. As part of the evaluation, we conduct pitch matching to see if we can identify the, the pitch of the tinnitus that the patient is perceiving. In this case, the patient pitch matched to a 12,500 Hertz pure tone pitch. So this correlated with the, the exact pitch that the patient was demonstrating the onset of the first pitch that the patient was experiencing hearing loss with in terms of his high frequency audiogram. Quite often um, what we see is when patients have hearing loss, they tend to pitch match within that range. So this was very consistent with that. The patient perceived a loudness of 14 decibels over the, the minimum threshold that was assessed at that frequency. So the tinnitus was actually very soft. Quite often patients will come in and say that their tinnitus is so loud and through the roof, but when we do loudness matching, the tinnitus is actually not too much higher, um, just not too much higher or above their, their threshold of that specific frequency. And as part of the examination, we assess a threshold, a threshold examination using broadband noise. And once we get that threshold, we then raise the noise up to what the patient perceives their tinnitus to be masked or no longer audible. And again, this is as long as it's comfortable to the patient. Some patients aren't able to mask their tinnitus. However, in this case, he was able to achieve masking with only six decibels of sound over, that broadband minimum over the broadband threshold level. So in other words, I could provide him relief with, very, with a very, very low amount of sound, which is a very positive indicator. It, it suggests that he'll be very receptive to sound therapy. We also conduct residual inhibition. Residual inhibition is conducted by presenting a particular sound, which is usually the pitch match at a set level for approximately one minute to both ears to see if when we remove the sound stimulus, if there's any residual suppression of the tinnitus. Responses, response, response options of the patient is usually that the patient say either the tinnitus got louder, the tinnitus got softer or went away, or there was no change in the tinnitus. Ideally, we want the patient to say that the tinnitus is softer or is temporarily not audible. In this case, the patient reported he had a slight decrease in his tinnitus for a short duration of time, Therefore, he was considered to have what we call um, considered to be partial residual inhibition. Loudness discomfort levels, LDLs or UCLs, are, um, are also assessed as part of this examination, and he was determined to have normal LDLs. This is important because it demonstrates there's no presence of hyperacusis. It's not uncommon for patients with tinnitus to present with hyperacusis as well that needs to be uh, co-managed or sometimes even managed before we start treating the tinnitus. Subjective questionnaires are also extremely important to include in the evaluation and management of the tinnitus patient. They're traditionally offered at the initial consultation, and then they can also be utilized throughout the management process to track um, improvement. They can be a really nice counseling tool with patients because um, the, the changes in tinnitus can be so slow and so gradual 
but the patients may feel like there's not change when in reality there is a, a shift on these that, that's reflected on these questionnaires. In our clinic, we commonly utilize the three questionnaires seen on your screen. The tinnitus functional index or the TFI assesses multiple tinnitus severity domains and ultimately allows the provider to identify where, what area they are most impacted by, by their tinnitus. So you can isolate um, your treatment to be focused right around this particular area. So if they're saying it's sleep, you can concentrate on sleep. If it's auditory, it's probably more of hearing loss. We can focus on that. If it has more with quality of life or emotion, we can refer and focus to mental health. The TFI um, it has an overall score of 100, and this patient scored a 97. So this indicates that the tinnitus was severe enough to qualify for more aggressive intervention. I also wanna draw your attention over here on the right. So here's his total score of uh, 96.8, which I round up to 97. And then for his subscales out of a possible score of 100, you see he's almost 100 for all of them. So he's really impacted in all aspects of his life. The tinnitus reaction questionnaire, or the TRQ, assesses the patient's perceived psychological distress with the tinnitus. Out of a possible score of 104, this patient scored a 95, so it's extremely high. And the higher the score that the patient um, receives, the, high, the greater the tinnitus distress is experienced by the patient. There's a specific question that addresses suicidal ideation. And this patient indicated that his tinnitus has led him to think about suicide a good deal of the time. We also use a mental health screener. And in this case, we utilize the Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale, or the HADS. The HADS has a possible score of 21 um, for the maximum score of 21 for subscales of anxiety and of depression. And in this case, he scored a 15. And so he would be considered to have um, abnormal scores for both of these, these subscales. So as you can see, this patient was in an extremely distressed state at the time of his appointment, and there were many things that needed to be discussed with this patient. Based on my concerns with his emotional and mental state at the time of visit, I discussed the results with the patient and his wife, including specifically addressing the concerns of suicide. You know, this can be a topic that can be very difficult to address. And a lot of times practitioners feel like they are intimidated by, by asking about mental health or talking about suicidal ideation, but it's something that's so critical to have that conversation about so we can get the patients the help they need if that's warranted. Um, when I addressed the concerns of suicide with he and his wife, the patient began to weep and he explained that, you know, he really didn't want to harm himself, but there were so many times that he really felt that his family would just be so much better off without him. He said that before January 2015, he was just this happy, healthy 48 year old. He had a great family. He loved his wife. He had good kids. He really liked his job and didn't have too much to claim, complain about. You know, not, not that the world was perfect, but overall he had a good life, not much to complain about. And his wife agreed with him. However, the sudden onset of symptoms in that six month span just really turned his life upside down. Because of his health conditions, he wasn't able to work anymore. He was spending the majority of time at his doctor's appointments. And because of his vestibular issues, he wasn't able to drive long distances. Unfortunately, based on where he was residing, the majority of his appointments were quite uh, far away from his residence. So his wife would have to take time off of her job to accompany him. And if he considered taking something like public transportation, it was an added expense that he and his wife just really couldn't swing at the time. So it did require the wife to take the time to be at the, present at the appointments. And the patient was really motivated to get better. You know, he knows that if he doesn't go to his appointments, he can't get better. So he wanted to present to those appointments. Financially, because he can't work, he can't contribute, and he was the breadwinner for his family. So this was resulting in significant financial strain. Additionally, his doctor's appointments, his evaluations, his treatments, and so on were just added expenses. 
He had applied for, but was not grant, granted disability at this time, at the time that this discussion was taking place. In regards to his marriage, um, the marriage was strained because of his chronic health issues and the financial issues, just you know, all of the stress. His wife was extremely stressed because she had to take so much time off for his appointments that she was starting to get in trouble at her work. But she indicated that you know, she really cared about her husband and she wanted to support him and she was trying her best to be there for him the best way that she could and knew how. And the patient confirmed that he did feel like he had this family support. It's important to have those discussions with your family, uh, with your patients about if they feel like they're supported um, because this can be such an isolating um, issue, issue for the patient to experience. And overall, there was just stress on the family as a whole. I counseled this patient, it was critical that he see a mental health provider to which he and his wife stated they had tried. They had really tried to get him in to see a provider, but the appointments either had wait times or six to, of six to 12 months out. The mental health therapists weren't taking on new patients or they would call offices and just simply not, a, not get a call back. So they were extremely frustrated. And the patient indicated he was very motivated to seek help and, and asked for my support for what I could do. Traditionally, I will just provide a patient with a list of mental health therapists that I recommend that they seek out after the appointment. Of course, unless it is a critical case, if it's a case where the patient is expressing suicidal ideation, then that case will be immediately escalated. Um, in this case, I felt like the patient was um, of higher need for more urgent care. So I reached out to a social worker in my building I feel extremely, extremely fortunate that I work at a, such a large hospital that has so many different healthcare providers and specialists um, and, and support staff that I can turn to. And I know with the University of Kentucky, you must have access to um, very similar um, individuals. So we're very fortunate, but the reality is that a lot of private practitioners or, or smaller practices don't necessarily have this network. Um, so it's important to be able to identify who some support resources can be for the patients in those time of needs. So my social worker, the one that I reached out to, was part of our oncology team. It's the only social worker we had in the building. Um, so I reached out to her and she said that, you know, unfortunately she wasn't able to take the patient on herself because the patient was not an oncology patient, but she was willing to help reach out to some of her contacts um, to help get the patient the need he needed and um, eventually this patient was able to secure an appointment. As sleep was a major issue for the patient, um, we wanted to make sure that we were targeting that. If you remember, if you can remember at the very beginning I was mentioning when he first presented to our ENT, he said that he was having issues with rolling over in bed. When he'd roll onto his right side, it would trigger these awful headaches and the pain from the headaches would wake him up. This would then trigger an increase in his tinnitus, and even if the pain went away from the headache, now he's perceiving his tinnitus and he's not able to fall back asleep. And sleep is just so critical for managing any of our, our conditions and staying healthy. It's the time for our body just to shut down and repair itself. And so if the body doesn't have an opportunity to do that, it, it, it can't get better. And also patients tend to be more agitated um, and, and you know, hyper-focused on their conditions in, in a negative sense if they're not rested. So I consulted with the sleep medicine specialist within our Department of Otolaryngology. I'm, I'm really lucky that I work with this individual a couple times a week in my location. And I told him about the patient's case and asked if he had any recommendations of maybe some things he talks about with his own sleep patients. And he showed me uh, this, this shirt here, this shirt, this tennis ball shirt. It's a t-shirt that has a pocket that you can put a tennis ball in that keeps the patient on their side. So when they try to roll back, the ball hits the mattress and it makes the patient naturally want to roll back onto their side. The other device he spoke with me about was this weighted belt where these belts, here, these weights here help keep the patient in place so they stay propped on their side. I had also talked to the patient that if these were options that, um, you know, maybe he was not comfortable with or not working for him, he might also consider a pillow that keeps him stable on his back, maybe even use something like a body pillow or, hey, even using a pregnancy pillow, nothing wrong with that, to keep him propped on his opposite side, 
or using a wedge pillow, not necessarily laying on it like in this picture, but laying propped with it to his side so he stays, um, so he avoids rolling onto that right side. Now, in addition to the issue of staying on his, staying off the right side, we also want to address the tinnitus issue at night. And so I highly recommended sound enrichment in the bedroom, whether that be through the use of a sound generator on the nightstand um, or through this head wrap here. This head wrap is called sleep phones. And what essentially is, is a set of headphones that's in a soft headband. The headband can connect to any device that plays music, like a smartphone, um, an MP3 player, um, or any similar device. It can be connected through a cord, it can be Bluetooth. Some of these devices have music built right into them. And so I had recommended that he couple the use of both, um, you know, one of, the, one of these sleep devices as well as the sound devices to, to co-manage his symptoms. Um, the individual should be using relaxing music that promotes sleeping and relaxation, like spa-like music, classical music, ambient sounds, anything that has a, a, a downbeat that goes with the resting beats per minute of their heart rate. And I did recommend that the patient keep the sound on all night long. So that way, um, you know, some patients use a timer if the tinnitus is just bothersome as they're trying to fall asleep. But because he did have issues of waking up in the middle of the night, he should, he should utilize the sound throughout the entire evening. When the patient's not at doctor's appointments, he says he's at home and um, you know, he's home alone and doesn't have anything to do. So ultimately this is a recipe of, for disaster for tinnitus patients because they're just sitting home alone, sitting in the quiet, listening to their tinnitus, which is not at all what we want them to do. So we together, we reviewed distractions and how distractions and activities can be uh, a very important part of his tinnitus management we reviewed breathing exercises, something as simple as inhaling to a count of three and exhaling to a count of five repetitively. Um, it can, can trigger our body to go into a relaxed state. I showed him various relaxation apps that also included guided, guided breathing and some nice soundtracks for him to facilitate relaxation. Um, one of my favorite apps is Relax Melodies. I found it, you know, quite wonderful that Dr. Dreschler also recommended in her presentation that she also likes Relax Melodies. Um, but besides them, they, there's also a number of manufacturer specific apps that are available for patients. If you do want access to any of these apps, you can certainly email me and I can send you the list that we provide to our patients. I also recommended activities, including exercise that were within the patient's physical limitation. So um, he was staying active throughout the day. And some of these activities included gen general household chores. I told him, you know, if you feel like you're not contributing to your family financially, I'm sure you could be a huge help to your wife if you're doing some daily chores around the house or food prep, um, you know, anything that could help give her a hand. Because the tinnitus was bothersome during waking hours, I also fit the patient with a budget level tinnitus sound generator device. Um, this is a small ear level unit that the patient wears on both ears, and it produces an ambient white noise that helps to dis distract from the tinnitus and ultimately can facilitate habituation and improvement of the tinnitus awareness. This particular device has Bluetooth streaming capabilities, so he also has the luxury of being able to stream any of his tinnitus apps directly into his devices. This particular case is one of my favorites because when I, um, you know, when I was meeting with him, he was just so upset during his appointments. Um, and then when I put this device on him and I activated it, he had an immediate positive reaction. Um, I put it on him. He was extremely excited. He noticed immediate improvement of his tinnitus um, and he started to cry. He took the device off. He really wanted to make sure his wife could hear what the device was doing and you know, she was excited for him. And if anyone's fit these devices, they know that this, not, this is not the reality. This is not what always happens. Sometimes it can take months before the patient has some long lasting effects from the tinnitus. Um, or some significant effects from the, the, the device itself. But when it does happen, when you do have these immediate 
improvements, it can be such a great feeling for not only the patient and their family, but also for the provider as well. So he wears this device all day, every day, and he takes it off before bed. I have seen him for follow-ups in, in recent months, and he has been adhering to using his devices on a daily basis. He loves them. He says they're a game changer for him. He's been able to establish mental health care um, close to his home. Um, because it is close to his home, he can take an Uber because um, it's not very expensive. Um, his, this, because of this, his wife has been able to refrain from taking a lot of time off of work. He has been continuing to go to vestibular rehabilitation therapy because again, his dizziness is still an issue. He is still seeing cardiology and neurology and so on. Um, and he did file again for disability and was, was awarded disability. So he now has some financial support um, from the state, which has you know, also been huge for the patient and his family. So I chose this case not only because he has this complex medical case where, you know, he's got this parietal stroke, cardiomyopathy, pre-existing left middle ear issue, a left utricle issue, a right high frequency asymmetry, left compromised auto hair cell, outer hair cell function, and right tinnitus. Um, you know, it's, it's just this hodgepodge of, of things happening, but also because it really took a collaborative effort to manage this patient, to manage those layers of the patient, his heart condition, his, um, he's managing that cholesterol, he's managing the dizziness, um, he's seen multiple providers for that. So it, it really takes a village to manage some of these real complex cases. In his case, he saw the multiple ER teams, he saw an ENT, neurology, cardiology, primary care, his physical therapist, his audiologist, his social worker, mental health therapist, and sleep management specialist. So, you know, that's just 10 specialists listed here. It doesn't even include how many specialists within each area he saw. Now, as ENTs, I'm, I'm sure that you have um, an audiologist that you can refer to, but what I find is that it can be difficult to find appropriate mental health support, especially if you're not in a major health care system. So before I wrap up the presentation, I just want to give um, some information on how you can find some mental health support for your patients. Psychologytoday.com is a really, really excellent resource. I give it to my patients quite frequently. Um, I have a list, a reference list, uh, pre-printed in my office. It has the, it has some tinnitus management, tinnitus coping tools on it, the, the apps I recommend, some common referral contact information, including this particular website. So if the patient was to log on the website, what you can see is there's an area that says find a therapist and they can enter their city or zip code at the top. This will bring up mental health providers in their local area. If they want, they can then identify what insurance they have and they can come down to the bottom here and they can utilize, they can highlight cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. Cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the most utilized um, mental health treatments for the tinnitus patient. There's a lot of literature um, recommending and showing, demonstrating the efficacy of CBT. So um, if you are having patients with anxiety, depression, or other mental health concerns secondary to their tinnitus, um, I would recommend that you refer them to a cognitive behavioral therapist. I also highlighted DBT um, because this can sometimes be a challenging specialty area to identify, to find. Um, this is more for patients who have misophonia, uh, but I did want to just show you because it was here on the screen. Um, and then in regards of issues, you're not going to find tinnitus listed under issues. However, there is anxiety. There is depression and coping skills. Um, and the, the main one that I refer patients to is chronic pain. Tinnitus is very, very similar to chronic pain. So if a patient needs to see a cognitive behavioral therapist and doesn't, isn't able to find one who's specifically a tinnitus specialist, I refer to somebody who is a chronic pain, um, pain management specialist um, and patients have had very positive outcomes with that. 
some other websites that you may find beneficial or you may want to refer your patients to. The American Tinnitus Association or ATA is a patient support site that they can go to that talks about you know, what tinnitus is, gives background information, and talks about management options for the patient. The British Tinnitus Association, the BTA, is a, another fantastic site. Um, they, they have a, a plethora of information for tinnitus patients. They're very, very active. Um, so I refer to that website quite often. The Tinnitus Practitioners Association, the TPA, can help you as the provider, as the healthcare provider or the patient, find a tinnitus specialist within their local area. So if you don't have somebody from your team that is, um, that is a tinnitus specialist and you don't know who to refer to, you can go to the TPA and put in their zip code to find a healthcare uh, tinnitus provider. And then the Tinnitus Research Initiative, or the TRI, um, it is, this website has a lot of really nice resources for healthcare providers, including a litany of various subjective questionnaires. And these are uh, validated subjective questionnaires, and they've been translated into a number of different languages. So, you know, a really, really great resource for healthcare providers. And these are my references. So again, I want to thank the team from the Corona Initiative, the University of Kentucky for inviting me to speak with you today. And I want to open it up. If anyone has any questions, then I'm happy to answer those. Otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. That was great. I don't see any questions right now, but um, like I said before, we'll get a lot of hits on the video and um, the link should be up tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning on our website as well. Wonderful. Well, again, I thank you for the opportunity. I hope everybody has a smooth transition as they go back into their clinics. Absolutely. And, uh, thank you. Know, Stay safe. Thank you. You as well.